Okay, so we are back. Uh, we're talking about acids and alkalis. Uh, acids, low pH. So we think about like battery acid, uh, any type of acid that that can eat away at metal and and other things, has an extremely low pH level. Uh, they will cause burn on contact. And now the 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 route of transmission here would be, for example, if we have um, absorption. If it's on the skin, what is that going to cause? Burning. Yeah, it's going to cause burning of the skin. Although that's going to be temporary. Eventually, it's going to, it's going to stop burning. Um, what else? Irritation. Redness. Redness. Swelling. Irritation. And swelling. Uh, what are, what about if it's ingested? Burning in the mouth, around the mouth. Okay. What else? Burning of the tongue, maybe swelling of the tongue or throat. Burning in the esophagus, and then once it gets in the stomach, some more burning, irritation. They can cough up or vomit blood. Uh, cause severe abdominal pain. And then alkalis, uh, can, they burn on contact, but they take a little bit longer to recognize that burning sensation. Um, this one's going to burn deeper because it continues to burn through the tissue. So it actually goes deeper in. Um, this one can burn for minutes or hours. And if it's ingested, it's going to likely adhere to the oropharynx and the esophagus. So cause more damage there. Some of them are, are uh, they interact with, with moist environments. So they're in, interacting with that. Um, so those two, we call them caustic substances. So like the alkali, again, uh, that could be like liquid draino. So what you'll see, again, uh, we talked about all that. Uh, difficulty swallowing as well, hoarseness to the throat, uh, maybe strider. And if it burned a hole in, in the esophagus or the stomach, we could also have bleeding. So the patient might exhibit signs and symptoms of shock as a result. So what do you think it would do for him? O2. Okay. PBM. Maybe PBM. Rapid transport. Okay. If people get, um, chemicals on their clothing, remove any contaminated clothing. Fire department might be able to decontaminate them depending on what the substance is. Um, but uh, regardless, you want to flush out the area. They might be able to do it with their decon procedures. Uh, if it's still burning, flush it some more. Remember, a lot of water for about 20 minutes. And it's the same thing with, for example, things get in the eyes, even with powders. Remove them, uh, chemicals in the eyes. You want to flush them out, copious amounts of water, which may see, basically means a shitload, and uh, flush them out for 20 minutes. Okay. Mm. So what can you guys tell me about uh, hydrocarbons?
they're found in household household products. Okay. Well, no. Usually found in like children under five. Not necessarily. It, it is a possibility, but gasoline can be ingested. Inhaled or absorption. Yeah, gasoline would be a good one. Yep. Crude oil, coal, plant sources also. So what does viscosity mean? The thickness. Okay. So hydrocarbons tend to have, or I'm sorry, not hydrocarbons. Yeah, hydrocarbons. Uh, they tend to have a lower viscosity. So what does that mean? It's a thin substance. It's a what substance? A oh, dense substance. Okay. Yeah. So what does that mean? That it's not going to slide down the back of the mouth into the stomach or down the esophagus very easy, right? It's going to be thicker? Yeah. So okay. yeah. that lumped together in the back of the throat? Yeah, it can, causing aspiration, causing uh, blockage. Um, so what do you think some of the signs and symptoms would be? Coughing, choking. Okay. Wheezing. Okay. Burns to the mouth or contact area. Okay. So I see you guys are reading from the book. But what did we cover earlier as far as ingesting something? Burns to the mouth, Burn, yeah. tongue, back of the throat. Now remember, not just burns to the mouth, but also discoloration to the mouth. Yeah. Okay. Abdominal pain, abdominal cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And Bloody the other stool. stuff that's more, what was that? Bloody stool. Maybe bloody stool. And then as the, the chemical starts getting absorbed into the body, now we're going to see other things as well. Uh, respiratory distress, uh, wheezes, strider, or that ingestion in general too. Uh, maybe cyanosis. Fever, seizures, and you guys see the rest of them in your book. So as far as emergency care for what we've already talked about, do you see really any difference from what we normally do? No. 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 Um, now... So, any questions on hydrocarbons? No, sir. No. Okay. So, no, sir. as far as as far as alcohol, you have. Uh, and I'm not talking about regular alcohol that you drink. I'm talking about wood alcohol. Alcohol? alcohol? No, that's isopropanol. Uh, isopropanol. So, 
Uh, wood alcohol or methanol is a different type. Remember, you find it in gasoline. Oh, no, that's ethanol. Sorry, methanol. Um, oh, yeah, you can also find it in, in gasoline, some paints. Um, it is a poisonous form of alcohol, but some people will still ingest it. People have been known to drink other types of alcohol when they ran out of drinking alcohol. They'll drink rubbing alcohol. They'll drink wood alcohol. Um, so the routes of entry for this can be obviously ingestion. Any others? Absorption. Absorption inhalation. and an inhalation. inhalation. Yeah. So we are, we've already talked about those signs and symptoms, correct? Yeah. That, now, what other things do you think you're going to get? Alter mental status. Alter mental status. Visual problems such as blindness, blurred vision. Yeah. Dilated Vomiting. pupils, huh? Vomiting. Maybe vomiting. Seizures. So kind of understand a little bit of what what methanol can do or rubbing or I'm sorry, what alcohol can do. Um, so first off, look at from the signs of exposure and then start looking at what else you can see. And because you're inhaling it, it's going in the bloodstream, it's going to get up to, to the brain. Also, the, um, the nerve impulses that are going to the brain are going to say, this is not good. Um, so medical care, anything different? No. 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 Just transport the hospital. They'll give them. The, they might be able to give them the antidote, which is uh, ethanol alcohol or um, for mapazone. What about rubbing alcohol? So again, people have been known to drink it either accidentally or intentionally. Um, the signs of uh, poisoning can, can take upwards of 30 minutes. Again, it has to go through the GI tract. It has to be absorbed and everything. So it's going to take a little bit. Uh, but besides the ingestion part of it, uh, it'll affect the breathing, slow respirations, shallow respirations. You still got ultra mental status. Um, maybe signs of shock because of the bleeding. Transport, anything different than what we've done for every other poisoning? No, it's rapid. about the same. Just rapid transport. Yeah. Now, guys, be careful what you get to drink from your significant other. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Why? <laughs> uh, there's been cases where the wives put ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze, into their husband's drinks. And it was better like with the green Gatorade because it's the same color. So they started poisoning okay. little by little by putting ethylene glycol or antifreeze into their drinks. Antifreeze, the one from the cars? Yeah. Oh, yep. wow. That's ethylene That's glycol. Can't they, like, taste it, though? It has a strange now they, taste, they though. Do. It, it didn't before, but now it does. Or according to one student told me that they started uh, flavoring it, so you can tell that they had put something in there. Back then it had like no flavor or what? 
Yeah, before it didn't have flavor. Uh, now um, has a sweet taste to it. Um, again, sometimes people will drink it if they find nothing else, and it's like, oh, ethylene glycol. All right, ethyl. And they'll drink it. Not a very good thing. Uncoordinated movements, seizures, hallucinations. And that's neurological, cardiac, difficulty breathing, rapid respiratory rate, respiratory distress, even a heart failure, it will start affecting the heart. And then third stage, it has different stages. Uh, decreased urine output, bloody urine, pain to the flanks because it's affecting the kidneys now. It's eating up at the kidneys. So a period of time, kidneys fail. If you don't get dialysis, you'll die. Um, there was another one. We were talking about the alcohol. Um... So one thing that uh, that college kids have found to do instead of getting drunk, or they still get drunk, but uh, instead of drinking it, you know what they do to get a, a quicker uh, sensation of being drunk? Oh, this isn't, isn't what I was going to tell you. But... Inhale it? Nope. Up the bum? What was that? Up the bum. Up the bum. But what do they do before they get it up the bum? Either nobody knows or nobody wants to fess up. Yeah, I would have known. They they soak a tampon in the alcohol. What? And then they put it in the rectum because it's very vascular, so it gets absorbed very, very quickly. And then instead of having to go through the stomach and the liver and stuff first, uh, it goes straight into the bloodstream. So they get drunk quicker. There's something else I was going to say about something, drinking something. Oh, well, maybe I'll remember it. All right, so any questions on the alcohol? No. No, sir. Oh, can you okay. start the recording? Already did. Yes. Yep. Right. Maybe a while back. Number seven. Another type of exposure, and this might not be like ingesting it, although some can. But um, there's other poisonous substances coming from plants. For example, poison ivy. They call it poison ivy. And yeah, it can be toxic if ingested. However, what is it really that you're having? An allergic reaction. Allergic reaction. And from what? Some of the vines from the poison ivy? No. <coughs> it's the oil on the leaves. Same thing with po poison oak. It's the oils on the leaves. That's why when you wipe your butt with, with poison ivy because you didn't bring toilet paper, you get a rash and it burns down there. 
it's because your body's having an allergic reaction to that oil that you're being exposed to. Okay. Um, and there's other poisonous uh, plants out there. Uh, if you don't know what it is before you eat it, just don't eat it. Um, so emergency care exposure really is supportive care. Poison oak, poison ivy, we don't carry calabine lotion. Uh, main thing, again, is remove uh, any uh, contaminated clothing. Um, do oil and water mix? No. No. M maybe not. Um, i trying to think. Maybe copious amounts will help, but really they need calamine lotion. So just get them to the hospital as soon as possible. I'm going to see if it works. I doubt it will, but let's see anyway. Um... You guys can't see my screen, can you? You guys seeing that screen where four people are on there? No, not yet. No. Okay. That's true. Damn it. For some reason, this computer didn't switch over. I'm using my Mac or MacBook Air. Um, and that's, it's not letting me show you a browser, which I don't know why. Um, oh, well. Um, so we were talking about what I was trying to do is show you chemical suicides. Um, and that's the next thing. L like I said, they, um, uh, they create a, a, a toxic environment by mixing chemicals. And some can even use a bag, suicide bags, where they, they um, put they could put helium, they could put nitrogen because it's lighter than air, it rises. So they hold on to it, they put it over their head and then they inhale that. Well, too much nitrogen, too much helium um, can actually be, be lethal. So um, with chemical suicides, and you guys can Google chemical suicide. Uh, what happens is most of the time, thankfully, they'll put a sign on the window that will say caution or danger, poisonous gas. Um, so we see that we back away because as soon as you open the door, what are you going to inhale? All the chemicals. Yeah, you're going to inhale that, the poisonous chemicals and now you can collapse. So it, it's better to be, it's better to just call the hazmat team. They'll go up and they'll, they'll open the door and, and air it out. Uh, but the patient still has the, the chemicals on their body, but they're dead. 
they're dead, so there's not uh, much we could do already. So the coroner will get them and take them away. All right. Um, as far as uh, poison control centers go, so we talked about different things, and this is why I, I wasn't making a big deal about learning all the signs and symptoms. And that is because there are poison control systems all over the country. And so if you have a patient that's been exposed to a chemical, or let's say they try to OD on a, on a medication or on a substance, I try to identify the substance and call the poison control and tell them, I have a person that ingested X amount or a known amount of this chemical. Oh, I remember the story I was going to tell you in just a sec. Uh, and so they will tell you what you need to worry about. So again, it's not that imperative that you memorize all the signs and symptoms for the different chemicals uh, because a lot of them are going to be the same, correct? Is, is that what we observed today? So a lot yeah. of the signs and symptoms yeah. are the same regardless of the chemical. Right. And so we should be able to recognize that, but more specific, that's just going to depend on the chemical. And like I said, it depends on the person, the chemical, and the amount. So as long as you could identify uh, any and all of the three, you have a pretty good idea of what might be occurring. But call the poison control center. Uh, there is a EMS number or a, a healthcare provider number that they have. I think it's like 800-222-1212 or something like that. Uh, you can put it in your phone or you can just Google it anytime you need it. Okay. Uh, to get that information and they'll tell you I, I had a attempted suicide a couple months ago and what I did was I called poison control and I said I have a patient that possibly OD on this um, you know what should I worry about and here I'm a paramedic with 20 years of experience and I still called um, um, a poison control center now the other instance where we called poison control and this is the story I was going to tell you was we got a call one day for a guy I forget what the call came down for but it was at a restaurant, at a golf course. And so we start assessing the guy and, he, and ask him what happened. And he's like, yeah, I've been drinking water all day because he's the chef at this restaurant. And he has a water cup that he drinks because it gets hot in the kitchen. So he goes to his water cup and starts drinking it. Well, eventually he's like, but what, what I noticed was I got really strong odor of bleach. What happened was the workers in the kitchen hated him so much, they started putting bleach in his water cup. Eventually, they put so much into it that he started smelling it. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so, so um, yeah, be, be very careful as far as what you do. All right. Um, so we called poison control and they said, well, the amount of bleach and the, the time, not much to do, just keep an eye on them. And that's what I did. I, we transported him to the hospital. I was in the back and just kept an eye on him. He, he, he regained consciousness the entire time. Well, the guy was, he wasn't big, but he wasn't small. He was probably over 200 pounds. So like I said, it, it depends on the size, the chemical and the amount. Uh, could he have had some uh, stomach damage yeah 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 but other than taking care of the the signs symptoms that manifested themselves what else could we do for them not much not much no. not much at all okay All right. So there's a substance. And because Rosie was a bartender, she can tell you a little bit more about this. There's a substance that comes in different size uh, shapes of bottles. And on a hot summer day, it's pretty good because it cools you down. The bad thing is it dehydrates you too. Uh, sometimes that in the evening, some people will wind down with a glass of wine, with a bottle of, or with a glass of sherry, with a glass of cognac, 
Oh, that was good, by the way. I did that in Atlanta years ago on a deployment. Uh, it was me, our law enforcement dude that was also a SWAT member of a police department, and uh, the pharmacist. And the pharmacist was paying. He makes good money, so <laughs> I didn't care. So we sat around in the lobby having a cigar and drinking cognac, a $40 glass of cognac. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was few. Oh, that tasted so good. It was it was nice and relaxing, so I could see what, why people drink cognac in the evening. <laughs> right now. Although I was missing the cardigan and the whatever that scarf is that they call, whatever they call it. But anyway, um, and I think I've mentioned that the body likes alcohol sugar, right? Yeah. Okay. Because it burns pretty good. It's a clean burning fuel. And that's why they use it in cars too. So the body loves it and it stores it. Now, anything that the body likes, it wants more, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I got George and George is eight years old. And George loves candy. So I give him a, some candy every night. Let's say three pieces of candy, whatever it is. Not a big candy bar, but three pieces of candy. I remember when they were 89 cents. Now they're like two ninety nine at the at the store. Yeah. And it's still the same size. Yeah, it's still the same size and everything now, except they charge you a lot more. Oh, anyway, I digress. But now all of a sudden, George is not happy with three. He wants four. So he's okay with four for a while. And then now four is not enough. He wants five. And eventually six. Well, I got to put my foot down. No more. You're eating too much candy. Little George. What's <laughs> little George going to do? Throw a fit. He's going to throw a fit. Now. With that fit, why did he throw a fit? Because his body's not getting the candy he was used to? Yeah, he wants his candy back. The body liked it. He liked the way it tasted and it made him feel. And now that he's not getting it, he's throwing a fit. Well, the same thing happens with drugs and alcohol. It makes the body feel good, so the body's like, oh, yeah, give me more. Mm. Right? However, when it doesn't get it, what happens? You go through withdrawals? Yeah. Literally, it, it's, it's a body throwing a hissy fit. Okay? It's a body throwing a hissy fit. Therefore, yeah, we call it withdrawals. Now, the hissy fit, if you ever saw the movie Ray or Walk the Line, you know exactly what happens. What happens? Watch those movies? No. I gotta add those to my list. What happens is they start going through uh, they, their hands start trembling. They go through night sweats, uh, nightmares, seizures, rapid heart rate, uh, maybe rapid breathing. Um, what else? Heart rate, breathing, seizures. Yeah, seizures is a big one. That's what withdrawals is. Has anybody experienced withdrawals? And not necessarily from drugs or alcohol, but from from something. Cigarettes. I mean, it wasn't where you started trembling, or maybe you did, but not the night sweats, the seizures. But didn't you have, like, intense cravings? Yeah. Yeah. You get a little bit irritated, too. Yeah. So, 
think about that, what's going on. It's the body is throwing a hissy fit. Do you think that the patient that's going through the withdrawals are going to be very pleasant to deal with? No. No. How might that patient behave? Combative. It might be combative. What else? Agitated. Okay, what else? Uh, anxious. Anxious. Just pissed off. Pissed off. How might their mental status be? Not well. Okay. They might be altered. They might be confused. Now, one thing about medical and uh, drugs and alcohol is that just because someone appears under the influence or intoxicated, that they are in fact under the influence or intoxicated. Always rule out a medical reason because something like diabetes can mimic intoxication. We'd never say they're drunk because if it ever goes to court, okay, Mr. Montes, tell us why you said that, they, that my client was drunk. Because you told Officer Amber that the patient was drunk, they arrested my client. So tell me why you said they were drunk. They'll just use it against you, like the same symptoms. Uh, maybe alter mental status, um, imbalance. Okay. Speech. So, Mr. Montez, where did you... Uh, get your training to assess for drunkenness. Nowhere. Okay. So then you're not qualified to determine whether someone's under the influence. True. And did you know that my client has diabetes? No. And do you know that when they got him to the hospital, they did a blood sugar level check and they found that he had low blood sugar? No. So what do you think is going to happen to that case? The EMT will lose his license? No, not necessarily. It just you'll, you're, You might have egg on your face. But the patient is going to... Uh, Want to sue? <coughs> Uh, yeah, the, the case will probably get thrown out of court. So we're not qualified to make the determination that, that's, that someone's under the influence of drugs or alcohol. We could do an assessment, but uh, to kind of help us, however, you have to make sure we do a regular assessment and find any medical conditions that might be wrong with the patient, number one. Number two, don't ever answer a cop's question as to a patient's status as far as, oh yeah, they, they appear to be drunk. Because again, you're not qualified to make that determination. The second thing is, when the cop asks you to find out, now you're acting as an agent of the police. And so in that case, you have to read them their Miranda warning. Because remember, anything they say can be used against them.
Um, yeah, so other than that, just be very careful. Don't ever assume anything. That's why I tell you guys, don't ever assume anything. If someone appears to be intoxicated or under the influence, um, just make sure there's no medical reason as to why. Even if you smell something on their breath, how do you know that's alcohol? All you can do is just put down, there was an odor resembling an alcohol beverage on board. That's what I was taught. Um, some other companies use something different. So. All right. All right. We talked about, oh, um, so have you ever been at a party where somebody got so drunk that they passed out? Yeah. yeah. What is the, what is the thing you have to worry about? The airway? The airway, why? Because they're basically unresponsive, so they can't really control it. Correct. They are unresponsive, so they're not able to protect their airway. Therefore, um, if they were to vomit, which, do you ever vomit when you've been drunk? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was just going to plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not um, me personally, but I'm saying like most people do. If they get like too drunk. I don't know how much they had and everything, but yeah, people can vomit. I've vomited before. Uh, last time I got drunk, I vomited, but we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, 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 uh. if they vomit, they're unresponsive or altered. They can't protect their airway. So vomit in the air in the back of the throat can be dangerous. One, it blocks the airway. Two, they can aspirate it, get vomit into the lungs, causing what we call aspiration pneumonia. So they could have a respiratory infection as a result of it. But the biggest thing is is dying. How many famous people have died because they got trashed and ended up uh, choking on their own vomit? Not even famous people, but other regular cases that has happened in. So, um, it can and does happen. And so, really, the, the easiest thing to do is just put them in a lateral recumbent position. That way, if they do happen to vomit, it just runs down the mouth or right out the mouth. Okay. Um, so, that's the biggest part about care here. I, we talked about drug withdrawals. Uh, same thing as alcohol withdrawals. Now, we, we mentioned how a person can be irritated, they can be violent, they can be combative. Uh, first off, remember that it's the, the substance that's making them that way. Uh, you have PCP patients that have superhuman strength and they have no, no sense of pain. So they're going to do more things than they normally would because they don't realize, ouch, that hurts. So they could do things to, to really uh, hurt you. Um, again, you want, to, you want to not assume that they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol unless they tell you, oh, oh yeah, they, they, they snorted some coke or they shot up some PCP or they did this or this or whatever. Uh, actually, they don't shoot up PCP. I meant shot up heroin or smoke PCP. Um, don't assume anything. But one of the things that you want to do when you're dealing with both psych patients, but also intoxicated patients, and, and I've seen this work with intoxicated patients, usually drunk, um, is build rapport with them. 
start talking to them. Try to make a connection. You'll notice that when you make a verbal connection with somebody, things are going to be a lot different. Have you noticed how my voice level came down and, and it's been slow and um, I don't want to say pleasing, but calming? Yeah. And that's what I'm referring to as far as the way you talk to them. It's called the talk down technique. It doesn't mean that you're talking down to them, making them, you know, insulting them. What it is is if you don't appear excited and, and anxious and nervous, then they'll feed off of that. I remember we had a call one time, uh, older guy, not that old, but for me at the time, I was about 28, so 27. Um, yeah, I was 26, 27. Um, the guy was a big guy. Older, he was in his 40s, 50s, maybe. And he'd been drinking and he was just being a belligerent and something else was up. So the wife called 911, police get there. Uh, we respond to ambulance and fire. And uh, I think we were there first. Anyway, my partner, uh, she started talking to the patient. Fire gets there and he's not being very responsive to them. So they see that, that he's responding to her okay. And so they just left her in charge of, of of that patient, which, sorry, George, but I usually call this patient George. I honestly don't remember his name and I wouldn't give you the name anyway. So uh, I'm kind of hoping it wasn't George, that patient, but I call him George. But again, <laughs> it doesn't reflect on you. It's all good. But the thing about George was, like I said, he was no slouch, but neither was the fire crew. They were all big guys. All of them were at least six foot. And uh, like half of them were very muscular. So it wasn't like they couldn't take care of themselves. But, you know, he was a big guy and he responded to my partner. My partner was no slouch either. She was like 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, um, and she could live. She can carry her own. And um, she uh, she was able to talk him down and got him to do what she wanted him to do. So it wasn't an issue. Uh, I don't remember. If I, I think I left her in the back. I'm usually very reluctant to let a female in the back with a violent patient or possibly violent. But she she had a meeting out of her hand. That made it that, that much easier. Um, I've talked about both those. Uh, we'll talk about it in second behavior. Okay. So being careful. Uh, the other stuff we kind of talked about, and then as far as alcohol intoxication, I think that we've all seen somebody under the influence of alcohol. Yeah. We, some of the things about alcohol. Uh, same thing with withdrawal. It's the same as drug withdrawal. The body just likes it, and when it's not getting it, it's going to go through withdrawals. All right, questions so far? No questions. Okay. So next up, we have opioids. The thing about opioids, basically, number one, is they derive from the poppy plant. Now, opioids can be natural, or they can be synthetic, or even semi-synthetic combination of natural products and synthetic products. Natural would be like heroin. Um, uh, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. Uh, same thing with uh, Nubane. It's a synthetic opioid, but the thing about Nubane is it's not a controlled substance. That's a good thing. In some, pla in some places it is, but not here in Texas. Um, I 
what opioids do for the most part is they reduce the sensation of pain. And how is that achieved? Affecting the nervous system? What part of the nervous system? And it's not attacking it. The central nervous system? No. Well, which essential? Remember, the, the categories of the nervous system, there's two. In functional, there's more. Would it affect the sympathetic nervous system? No. Remember, there's the central and the peripheral nervous system. All right. And as a result, opioids affect the central nervous system. Well, what's the major component of the central nervous system? Breathing. Breathing. So what's, what's an opiate going to do to your breathing? Slow it down. Slow it down. Slow it down. Okay. So that's the danger of opioids is it affects the central nervous system, primarily the respiratory drive. So it slows it down. Again, pain is also processed in the central nervous system. So because it's affecting your, your central nervous system, you won't feel pain. That's why like uh, Oxycontin, fentanyl, morphine, Demerol, they're all opioids. And that's why you feel no pain because it's affected that central nervous system. All right. So... When you take too much of it, not only are you not going to feel any pain, again, respiratory depression, uh, how nimble are you when you're under the influence of drug, or, or, of, yeah, of drugs, especially a painkiller? Are you loopy? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Are you drowsy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a bunch of others that there are on here, so. Yeah, it affects the brain, the nervous system, opioids, block pain sensation, blood pressure. Yep. All right. Um, so what do you think the emergency care is for this patient that's under the influence of an opioid? BBM. When? Mm. 
if breathing is inadequate. <clears throat> okay, how so? Stretch it out. How would, remember, there's a lot of things that are going to lead up to inadequate ventilation. But if you go back to what I've taught you, you can tell me exactly why. The number of respirations, since it's depressing the respiratory system. Okay, and um, what's that number of respirations? Um, well, for this one, it would be less than eight, eight or less. There you go. If the respiratory rate is eight or less, then you would assist ventilation. So part of the care is oxygenation and BVM if necessary. Eight or less respirations a minute. Okay. Um, what else can you do for this patient? Narcan? Yes, Narcan. Um, did I show you guys the, the Narcan administration video? Although I can't deal with this computer. Um, remind me to show you that video when I have a different computer. Um, but how can we give it as EMTs? By uh, atomizer. Yep, the mucosal and atomizing device or the MAD device. And then there's some that um, that comes in the nasal spray already, the small little device. Uh, that's what we used to use at, at Speaking Rock, the small little thing that goes in the nose. Uh, it wasn't in a syringe in, in a, a MAD device at the end. It was just a, a nasal spray that we could administer. Uh, and it works. We, we use it a lot, believe it or not. All right. Uh, then you have other drugs as well. You have PCP. Uh, also known as angel dust. Like I said, it gives people superhuman strength. They have no sensation of pain, so they don't know that something is hurting. I heard a story of a guy that was handcuffed uh, with his arms to his back, and he just brought him forward, tore all the connective tissue in his shoulders, but he didn't know any better. Um, so you really have to watch out for, for violence with these patients. Um, you have cocaine. Um, you guys have heard the story about Coca-Cola and cocaine? Yeah. Yep. Um, all right. So we're going to class officers answered, so I'll go with that. Um, but cocaine used to be used like in dentistry. Anybody know why? To numb? Besides numbing. Keep the patient awake? Nope. It's a very the rush, the adrenaline stricter. I'm sorry? A rush, so like the adrenaline? No, no. No, it's a very potent vasoconstrictor. In other words, it closes uh, off the blood vessels. So in dentistry, it minimizes the amount of bleeding that occurred during a dental procedure. Now, uh, cocaine is usually uh, snorted, inhaled, although um, crack, which is a type of cocaine that is melted and can be injected or even uh, smoked. I think usually smoked. Uh, but the, the, thing, the thing about cocaine is that, again, it causes vasoconstriction, 
but it also constricts the coronary arteries. So an overdose can be fatal, and people have been known to to die after the first uh, time they took cocaine because it closed off their heart vessels. That's why uh, people that do a lot of cocaine tend to have heart problems. Um, I had a 17-year-old kid I, I ran on one time. He was in juvenile hall. I went to check him out. He was uh, tachycardic. Well, when I was monitor, he was in SVT, meaning really fast heart rate. So I had to give him medicine to literally stop his heart uh, and let it reset. And he already knew he had this condition. He knew exactly how much medication it took to convert him. And again, the reason why his heart was already messed up at 17 was because he was a, a regular cocaine user. So That's crazy. Yeah. All right. You also have amphetamines and methamphetamines. Uh, there's different types. There's tablets, there's powders, there's capsules. And then uh, also, if you saw the movie or the TV show Breaking Bad, how else was methamphetamine uh, found? Rockish, something like that. Like rock. Yeah. Crystal. Yeah, rock. Um, I want to say, well, crystal too, crystal meth. Um, and so again, they, they smoke that. Um, where else are amphetamines used? Labs. Okay, besides that. Like at parties? Or maybe I shouldn't say where, but no, no, no. Not like locations where you would find people using it. I'm saying in in what type of products would you find it? I don't mean tablet pills, that kind of stuff. I'm talking about. Benadryl? Or nope. allergy medicines, I mean? No. Nope. Well, yeah. And that's why you can't go to the store and just get it off the shelf. You have to ask for it. And I think that I haven't bought Sudafed in a long time. Um, but I don't know if they take a copy of your ID. And they restricted it because that was one of the products in, in methamphetamine production, the uh, pseudoephedrine. In diet pills. It gives you more energy, so you're burning up more energy, thereby losing weight. But what's the danger of using amphetamine and methamphetamine? Tachycardia, hypertension, so it's going to raise your, your blood pressure through the roof. Yeah, you lose weight, but then you have other heart issues. So the cool thing about, about those drugs is, when you lose weight, but you also hallucinate. Have you guys heard of bath salts? Yeah. Of what? Bath salts. Yeah. All right. What can you guys tell me about bath salts? It stimulates the central nervous system. Okay. Um, I used to take bath salt with Epsom salt when I sprained my ankles or stuff like that. Okay. So reduce swollenness. Okay. Help with the pain? Yeah. Okay. The other thing, though, about bath salts is they can be abused. So they'll crumple them up, they'll snort it. So the signs and symptoms are pretty much... Uh, could be the same as as with uh, PCP. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm sorry, uh, methamphetamine and cocaine. Uh, it's also a stimulant. So what happens is that uh, it blocks the release of or the reuptake of norepinephrine and dopamine. So you don't uh, get up. You don't get excited. So it kind of chills you out in a way.
actually uh, what else um although you're still going to have the hypertension tachycardia uh but the one bad thing about it too is that it raises your blood pressure or not your blood pressure your your body temperature I'm trying to remember if ecstasy that does that too. Yeah, it does. You notice people drinking a lot of water at a club? Yeah, they're all sweaty and stuff too. Yep, because they took ecstasy. In a lot of places, that's where you find it in uh, in clubs. Um, I actually. Let me rephrase what I said about bath salts. Uh, it has sympathetic effects. Therefore, again, we talked about blood pressure going up. We talked about uh, heart rate going up. But it's inhibiting the reuptake of it, which doesn't mean much for now. But, um, so we're talking about ecstasy. Um, I don't, I can't remember all the names. I've never tried it, so I couldn't tell you. But um, with ecstasy, it, it, it enhances sensation. It causes a feeling of euphoria. I usually find in pill form, although they also have liquid. I think that's one of the names, liquid X. Uh, that they put it in drinks, they take the tablet, they feel euphoric. But again, one of the signs would be the elevated um, body temperature, insomnic, the heart rate's be beating fast. Um, and you see other things, but when we're talking about these drugs, and again, I just want to summarize it, is that um, we, we have to we have to take care of what's affecting our patient. Some of them have antidotes, opioids, and others don't. It just it has to go through the system. So what we're providing for them is supportive care, supporting their ABCs. If they're hot, let's cool them down. Let's turn on the AC. Let's you got to be careful about giving them water too. I mean, uh, at times you can, but the rule of if they can't hold it in their hand, then they can't drink it. But the best thing is just turn on the AC, let them start cooling down. Um, it has to start going through, uh, going through their system or getting out of their system. Okay. Um, Other than that, there's really nothing different than we do for any other patient when it comes to, to these drugs. Now, somebody earlier had said, and I remember having this discussion with a student previously, has to do with marijuana. So talk to me about marijuana. It's inhaled. It's in a health rate. Okay, increase your heart rate. Slows. Okay. It mellows you out. What else? Yeah, it's like a depressant. What was that? Well, I was mentioning that it was like a depressant. Okay. It reduces pressure within the eyeball, so it assists glaucoma. It gives you an appetite. Some would call it the munchies. Uh, what else? You can get sleepy you get depending on. Yeah. What was that? Gets you tired, tired, sleepy, or awake. Tired, sleepy. Impaired motor skills. Impaired motor skills. Eyes are reddened. Dry mouth.
I don't know what side of the spectrum you guys fall on, whether you believe that marijuana should be legalized or not legalized. There are bad effects to it, okay? Some people will say, well, alcohol does too, and alcohol is legal. Okay, that may be the case, but it's still illegal to drive under the influence of alcohol. Yeah. So it should be legal to drive under the influence of, of marijuana. And that's what happened in uh, Colorado shortly after it was legalized up there. Uh, a guy was, was stoned and he was driving and he killed, uh, he killed uh, I don't remember if it's a guy or a lady. Uh, but what happened was that that person's spouse actually ran on that call and they saw their dead spouse. Marijuana is used medically. And that's why they're trying to get it away from Schedule 1 to Schedule 2, that there are some accepted medical uh, applications for it. For example, cancer patients, AIDS patients that are not eating much, they can get marijuana to help them uh, give them an appetite so that that way they gain weight. Uh, there is a medication called Marinol that has THC in it. So they prescribe that instead of smoking it. Although nowadays they're prescribing the, the smoking uh, p- part of it. Um, as far as someone overdosing from marijuana, uh, the THC level, with the TAC is what causes the effects, but the, 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 the chemical has such low toxicity that really people are not going to overdose and die from smoking too much marijuana. So that's a positive if there's any positives. Uh, but along with that, they also have synthetic cannabinoids or cabinet, cab, cannabinoids. Ugh. The thing about synthetics, though, is they make the effects even stronger. So more hallucinations, uh, extreme anxiety, uh, violent behavior, suicidal thoughts. And they're considered to be very, very addictive. Now, you have a condition called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. What's hyperemesis? Vomiting a lot. Yeah. And so they'll vomit a lot. They can be nauseous a lot. Abdominal pain, that's from all the uh, vomiting because your your abdomen muscles, abdominal muscles tighten up. Uh, they say that a hot shower can or bath can reduce the symptoms temporarily. But um, really the best thing is just to quit them, to let the, the, the symptoms go away. Questions? No, sir. No, sir. Okay. So the next one is um, medication overdose. Now, with medication overdose, just like everything else, could be intentional or unintentional. Intentional would be like a suicide attempt. Uh, and that's usually what women use, is um, a, a non-violent method of, of committing suicide. Uh, so they'll they'll take pills. Uh, it depends on the pills. Again, the person, the amount, and the and the drug is going to determine what's going to happen. Uh, for example, Tylenol. Too much Tylenol will damage the liver to the point that the liver fails, and now they they need a 
a liver transplant or they could die as a result of it. So it, it really is dependent. Now, the other thing that happens too is, and this is why you have to be very, very careful. Always talk to your doctor. If you're on medications and you take herbal supplements or any type of supplements, make sure you run it by your physician first to make sure it's okay for you to take them. Because sometimes those supplements, whether herbal or non-herbal, um, can, can amplify the effects of your medication. And now you could have adverse effects as a result of that. So really, it's, it's really hard to say what you're going to see other than what is that medication used for or ingestion or whatever the case is. But some supplements can intensify the effects or even diminish the effects of those medications. And I always forget, but um, I call it puffing, but I guess the actual term for it is huffing. And that's the, the spray paint that I was telling you about. Uh, so they inhale it, and then the chemicals within that paint, when it's inhaled, it actually gives a euphoric sense. Uh, don't ask me why, because I really don't know. Uh, but they say that the gold color gives a better high than like silver. Again, they put the paint inside the bag and then they they inhale it. But because it's paint, those particles are floating around in that bag. When they put it up to their face, then those particles have somewhere to sit around the mouth and around the nose. Um, but it's not just paints that they could use. They could use things like Freon. I talked about nitrous, so uh, things with the gas propellants, um, even glue. Uh, what's the other one? Somebody, we're talking about it in the advanced class. Uh, that keyboard cleaner as well can cause euphoric scent, but it, it does have its dangers as well as to inhaling a keyboard cleaner. So in your assessment, you want to look for those signs that they maybe sometimes with markers, they'll paint their nose or their upper lip. Um, again, the paint around the face, they'll give you an indication. So really, the treatment is, again, remove them from the environment, get them out into fresh air, uh, maybe give them some O2, depending on how they're shedding and what the respiratory rate is, and then just transport them to the hospital. A lot of times, if there's no antidote for a, serp uh, a serp certain type of overdose, uh, they'll just observe them for a while, make sure they come down okay. Again, they would do supportive care, but that's, that's on them. But a lot of it is just observation. Okay. So questions, comments? No, sir. No, okay. Sir. So what I was thinking was, uh, it's already 1132. I could start on the next one, but that's a lot of stuff to talk about as well. Um, get what chapter it is. Oh, it's, it's like abdominal, uh, abdominal emergencies. And that could take upwards of an hour to two hours. So... I'd rather concentrate on that with a little bit more time than just 30 minutes, even though we will continue on tomorrow with, with that chapter, but I'd rather start fresh with that chapter. Um, but I'll go off for you. I know what the schedule says, but psych emergencies actually is not that bad of a chapter um, because tomorrow we were scheduled to do um, submersion emergencies and environmental emergencies. And that's really not too bad. Um, I do paint pictures on that one as well. well. Sort of metal pictures. So I'm not so worried about it tomorrow. And again, we still have Wednesday, which is psych emergencies. And we can finish up everything uh, on, on Wednesday, I, I feel. So what do you guys think? 
Yeah, it sounds like a plan. Sounds good. Just start on it tomorrow. I agree. Okay. And we'll just do homework for today's chapter. Yeah. Yeah, there there was a lot of stuff. It is a big chapter, but a lot of it is just, I don't want to say using common sense, but when you understand the way that things get into the body, think about how that substance is getting into the body and what you're going to have. Like Luis explained it, don't get out of the box in this case. Just follow it through. What are some of the main things you're going to see? And like I said, the the signs and symptoms are going to be dependent on the person, the chemical, and the amount. So, some stuff to think about. Okay. Any comments or questions on, on this chapter? No. Mm-hmm. Okay. Not that everything goes. All righty. So, um, uh, hey, I don't have anything else for you. I'm going to be going to the office in a little bit. Uh, I'll be working on your grades. So, hopefully, I'll get something posted. I have class at 3 30, so I won't have a lot of time, but I'll, I'll see what I can do to give you current grades. Okay. Yeah, no worries. You're good. I hope you guys caught up on your on your homework. So, all right. Yes, sir. All right. All right then, have a good day. Uh, then I will see you guys tomorrow. All right. All right. Have a good one. All right. Y'all have a all good right. day. Have a good one. Later. Right. Have a good day. Bye.